All right, Mike check. Okay, it's almost that time. Uh, checking the roster. See if I missed anybody. But we're in record mode, so let's see what I got. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. It says twenty-one. Who am I missing? That got that got that. Then. Okay, but the system records it. So, um, welcome, welcome. I currently have uh, 21 out of 28, not too bad. Can, uh, is there anyone who cannot see my screen? I'm going to try to monitor the chat as much as possible uh, and uh, uh, kindly keep yourself on mute. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, put it in the chat or um, during the break during the break time. Or I periodically I'm going to look at uh, the chat. Okay, I got Miss Stansel. Thank you for that message. But again, the system uh, the system sees it. Like who's trying to log in and and, and that kind of thing. Right, and uh, I'll go over uh, the, it prints out a roster, so don't worry about it. Uh, and if you uh, if you know somebody who's trying to log in, can't log in, uh, best thing to do is um, uh, just shoot me an email so that, um, you know, it's legal email. All right, what are we doing today? Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, get a commercial out for the announcements. Your uh, since yesterday, your projects uh, are now due next week on uh, in seven days. And uh, if you look at your announcements, bringing the announcements over here, you look at announcements, your topics are already assigned to you. There's no switching. There's no, it's a little bit, it's hard to, maybe you might have to draw a line or something. Uh, but uh, yeah. Um, so um, make sure that uh, you start doing that. And there's a link right here to um, what are we kind of looking for? And also, if you go into modules, I updated it yesterday afternoon as well. When you scroll all the way down to your um, course project submission, you'll see something. You'll see these, uh, you know, these, uh, these little uh, message. So the big thing is it's worth 10% of your grade. 50 points or 5% is uh, essentially the PowerPoint itself. Um, you know, is the spelling good? Is it, um, is it neat? Is that, there's a whole bunch of things. And you can look at this project rubric and uh, for hints on how to, you know, how to get an A on this thing. And also when you click on this as well, there's uh, presentation topics. Oh, well, that's already I already gave you that topics, but um, it's also uh, more helpful hints and instructions on how your PowerPoint uh, should be. And remember, there are no late submissions. Um, please, please, please. And uh, the deal is that if you do it early and then I see something, uh, you can go fix it before 8 a.m. Tuesday, March 26. And of course, um, um, be called at random after um, like around nine o'clock or so after our uh, exam four. And as you guys know, exam three will be postponed until Thursday, 8 a.m. because um, they're having advisory boards today. Okay, so let's now go on to the lecture proper. And, um, you know, you shouldn't go too crazy with taking notes and stuff because this is being recorded. Um, let's see now. Oh, unit four lectures. Let's look at 23. Okay. 
Ugh, ugly babies. So gross. Okay. All right. What are we doing now? It's growth and development. So uh, right off the bat, you got two terms. It looks like a, uh, is it this one? Is it that one? Both A and B. Growth means increase in size. It means increase in cell numbers or um, nice little review for Thursday. It's, it's essentially mitosis. Somatic cells just growing either in size or number. But development, I want you to think about uh, timing. And if uh, any of you are planning to go into uh, pediatrics or neonatology, um, both departments are all big on um, when do things happen. So in pediatrics and developmental um, studies, it's called milestones. You know, like uh, a marker on the side of the road, you're like five miles out, 10 miles out. And everything's about timing. So if you're looking for a development, a question or development answer, you're gonna think about the, uh, not cell size and number, you're gonna think about the timing. When should cells grow? And uh, right off the bat, you have a when, which is uh, prenatal, right? And postnatal. Of course, you also have perinatal for the future obstetricians in the room. Let me write this one thing down. Okay. So prenatal is everything from fertilization to birth. So fertilization is when the egg meets the sperm and all the way uh, to uh, birth, right? Or when labor starts, that's your prenatal period. The perinatal period is the actual, uh, what they call EDC, expected date of confinement or uh, parturition, that's another word. That is when the birth is actually happening, the day of, or the days of. Postnatal period is from birth to death, and that covers a whole bunch of other ground. Okay, so pre, fertilization to birth, peri, date of birth, post, from birth to death. Okay, let me move this. Don't bother me. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Fertilization. We already know fertilization is when the oocyte, and they call it the secondary oocyte because if you remember the um, the the ovum looks like this. Okay, that's the ovum. But there's all this other stuff, and of course. Uh, you have different structures. So it goes, this is called the secondary oocyte because there's all there's there's all these other things that are uh, associated with it. And this this thing right in the middle, that's the thing that has the 23 um, uh, 23 chromosomes. When, of course, the sperm gets through the two layers, right? Remember uh, a nice little review for um, for Tuesday, well, not Tuesday, Thursday, right? Of course, the acrosome head, it's a cap. This is the sperm. It's going to go in there and it has to get, because it has to get through uh, the corona radiata first. So the acrosome has a bunch of enzymes. We get through that. And then once it hits the inner sanctum here, which is your zona pellucida, and hits the nucleus that has the 23 chromosomes, the zona pellucida then closes it off, okay? So because that's fertilization and it happens in the infundibulum of the fallopian tube. So the fallopian tube is the big whole tube, but the infundibulum is that one little expanded part that looks like the beginning of a bell of a horn or a trumpet. And that's where fertilization takes place, okay? And of course, ovulation is the release of that egg. And if we looked at this picture right here, trouble. If you look at this picture right here, this is um, your ovary. And again, like we stated, um, during day 14 of a 28 day cycle, what happened? The best egg, the, the best follicle, um, um, gets released. 
And you'll see you have a whole bunch of support staff that's supporting the inside part, which is your secondary OO site or your secondary ovum, right? And that's the, and that liberated ovum, that's the one that's going to get fertilized at the level of the infundibulum inside the fallopian tube. And it takes about 12 to 24 hours. And guess what? Typical sperm, 24 to 48 hours. But again, there are um, there are some books that say like five days. Uh, so um, not a lot of time. Not a lot of time for that sperm to get there. Okay. Um, but it can get there pretty quick within an hour. But remember, right? Um, uh, it can, it has the potential. But remember, the vaginal canal has a lot of obstacles. Okay. And the obstacles are built in there for not only protection of uh, mommy, um, um, it's, um, it's also, it, it's, its function is also for uh, not only immune protection, it's also to, you know, you want the best, so you have to go through some trouble. Okay. And uh, sperm is in the hundreds of millions, right? And look here, even this one says six days, uh, but um, other classes before have been about five days, and my training says 24 to 48 hours. But, uh, but typically, if you look at the O site, doesn't last that long. So even if you had like super sperm, like eight days, six days, whatever, the ovum, the egg, doesn't last very long. Okay. And of course, where's the infundibulum? It's this area, the expanded area here of your fallopian tube. And this is highly exaggerated uh, for education purposes. Of course, the corona radiata is the outer layer, the acrosomal enzymes that are in the cap or acrosomal cap of the sperm it have enzymes that are gonna eat away at the corona radiata. Then once those acrosomal enzymes eat away at the zona pellucida, right? Uh, it's a glycoprotein layer, so what will it do? It forms a glycoprotein wall. The second the sperm gets into the nucleus, zona pellucida shuts down, and it will shut, it'll close all the doors, and let's say, for example, uh, number two swim buddy is within the zona pellucida, it'll be trapped there. Only one will make it, because we, on, uh, we only need one sperm, 23 chromosomes, and I have one egg, 23 chromosomes, 23 plus 23, 23 from mommy, 23 from daddy, and you got 46. Okay. Oh, do, 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 do. secondary oocyte, meiosis, and of course, that's when we start having uh, uh, the mixing of the lovely genetics, right? Okay. Uh, pronuclei, nice to know. Now, Fertilization of the egg, you can't call it an egg anymore because it's now 46 chromosomes. It is now called a zygote, okay? And 46 chromosomes, another uh, word for that is diploid, D-I-P-L-O-I-D, and that's, of course, 2N level of chromosomes because you have 1N from a sperm, 1N from an egg. It got fertilized. Now you have 2N or 46 chromosomes and that is called now a zygote. And like we saw here, you have your uh, corona radiata first, and then the zona pellucida. So uh, this is number one, right? Contestant number four here made it, right? This is the enzymes from the acrosomal cap. The second this, uh, this sperm gets in, delivers its 23 chromosomes, this entire glycoprotein layer uh, hardens up. So anything that's in here gets trapped. And the only thing that made it was the genetic material of a single sperm. Pregnancy, of course, uh, typically uh, pregnancy is about 38 to 40 weeks. Add that to your notes, 38 to 40 weeks. It's called AOG or age of gestation. Anything prior to 35 weeks is a problem, okay? Um, and is considered a relatively high risk, right? Um, premature uh, babies. And remember, uh, when you uh, think about um, uh, prematurity, the 
uh, the fetus is in fully development. Fast and slide. Ms. Campbell, can you please uh, mute your, let me mute it for you. If I can, All right, thanks. So um, um, the prenatal period is divided into three stages, pre-embryonic, embryonic, and of course the fetal stage, right? And remember, any uh, we're going to be talking about genetics in the next chapter. At any time, the genetics can stop it, even after, even postnatal. Um, remember, I was sharing with you my theories uh, regarding, and it's not only my theories. I, I, I've spoken to uh, several of my uh, obstetrics and neonatology catalog, um, um, uh, colleagues, and they they believe the same thing that it's already pre-programmed. It's already genetic. Um, stop codon and a stop codon can be inserted anywhere at these stages. So what are the three stages within this 38 to 40 weeks? And of course, 40 to 42 weeks. If we go beyond 42 weeks, that's not good either. Right. That's called post term. That's not good. Dr. G, can I ask a quick question? Shoot. So when you said it might be a silly question. So when you said like the DNA could just the um stop you're talking about like in the when you had referenced in another class like when babies are just like they just yeah, are like like, SIDS. like dead like sids like um uh i had i had a mommy had ha she was on her sixth pregnancy and we thought everything was all cool and then a, um uh spontaneous abortion at the fetal stage and the mother was devastated because she thought she did something wrong um mommy okay. could do everything wrong and the baby still will be born. Uh, remember my example was crack babies? Delivered a dozen of those. Um, mommy did not care. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there are good people and not so good people. And um, uh, those mommies, they did everything in their power to kill that baby and it still lived. And then there are other mommies, they do everything right. Um, so remember genetics is also a lot to play in these uh, stages, and that's why when you take an obstetric history, you want to know, hey, how was your previous pregnancies? Hey, how was your uh, your own your own birth? That kind of thing. So the pre-embryonic stage, that's that's the zygote uh, that goes into the second week. So what happens? The cells, right? Once there's fertilization, they're going to start splitting and then dividing. Okay. So period of cleavage. Cleavage is when you could see here, like the cell splits into two, then two turns into four, four turns into eight, eight turns into 16, right? All of these cells, right, during this uh, cleavage stage, which is the pre-embryonic stage, all of them, the general term is called a blastomere, right? But the specific term for a solid mass, about 16 cells, is called the marula. Now, the marula is important because, uh, as you recall, we talked about how there was like a current. Remember the fimbriae, like flapped their little fingers, and it makes a current, so that you know uh, there's some water in here, so that the uh, fertilized egg can now start moving down and then implanting in its proper place, which is the uh, endometrium. Uh, typically superior anterior wall of your corpus, which is right around here, right, uh, to go there. Now, uh, you guys know if you have like, uh, if you have something that's floating, that's really light, you can't really control it. Like, like let's say, for example, um, 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 I, I, I put something really light, like a feather or, you know, a floating piece of paper or something on water. It, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to uh, be heavy enough to to um, uh, to float down and end up here, and it won't be developed enough either to properly implant itself in here. So once it goes to like 16 cells, so it starts cleavage starts at two, then two turn into four, four turn into eight, eight turn into 16. Once it hits the marula 16 cell stage. Then it's heavy enough to start floating down and then, of course, end up in the endometrium right here. Okay, so remember that marula, preembryonic, 16 cells. Oh, here, here here's an, another picture. Okay. 
And it happens in a couple of days, give or take. Now, what's the blastocyst? Blastocyst is a hollow ball of cells that attached to the endometrium. Now, you'll notice that there's going to be an inner cell mass, and anything on the inside is delicate and uh, kind of important. So the inner cell mass will lead to the embryo. And then the outer cell mass, known as the trophoblast, will lead to all the support structures for this embryo. Okay. And one of the uh, things that the trophoblast or the outer cell mass does is produce this um, hormone called HCG, which is human chorionic gonadotropin. This is nice because um, we're going to learn that HCG starts, uh, starts telling the uterus, hey, we're pregnant now. We have to do some things and we have to change. And now once there is uh, fertilization and then implantation, there's going to be a whole set of hormonal signals for pregnancy. And one of the first ones, well, if not the first one, is human chorionic gonadotropin, which is coming from your outer cell mass, also known as your trophoblast. So blastocyst has an inner cell mass and an outer cell mass. And the blastocyst is the ball that attaches to the endometrium. And they have that picture right here. Zoom a little bit. So that's the blastocyst. And you'll see it makes these little feet, they're called podocytes, and it's going to dig right into the endometrium, which is the inner part of the uh, uterus. You see the perimetrium is on the outside, and then the myometrium is all in the middle, but the endometrium is all on the inside. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we got. Now, HCG maintains the corpus luteum. Now, what does that mean? If you recall, when we looked at uh, this thing, remember our menstrual cycle diagram and a nice little review? Uh, it looked like something like this. So if we're looking at this, right? now, Typical menstrual cycle in a 28-day uh, cycle, right? It has progesterone, and then the endometrium is nice and thick. But then what happens when we get close to day 28? Those estrogen starts kicking up, and then what happens? Those, it'll signal uh, day one of your menstrual cycle, and then you'll have menstrual bleed and sloughing off of the endometrium. But if you're pregnant, think P for pregnancy. goes, here's the corpus luteum. It's going to maintain the corpus luteum. That means this whole menstrual cycle goes, will, will stop cycling. It'll keep on going. So think P for progesterone, this line right here, and it's going to keep on going. And then what's going to happen to the uh, endometrial cells? It's going to keep on going because who's in there now? That future fetus, right? It needs nourishment from the arteries and veins that are in between all of these spaces, okay? So, please. So that's what HCG does. It maintains progesterone. Think progesterone um, uh, pregnancy. And then that's why you don't have your menstrual cycle during pregnancy because it stops, because we need that endometrium. It can't be sloughed off. So the endometrium has to stay nice and thick, and this will grow, and uh, so will this. And you can see inner cell mass, this is stem cells. That's future fetus. But the outer cell mass, all this brown stuff, is going to uh, dig in, and it's going to also eventually become the placenta. Okay. Implantation. Of course, the blastocyst has proteolytic enzymes. It has to eat away at that endometrium so it can plant in. And um, I call them podocytes. Actually, that's another word, word for the microvilli. These little feet or these little fingers start invading the endometrium because it's got to dig in there. And that's why actually a lot of women think they have their period, but it's irregular or it's light. That's why they don't get diagnosed uh, pregnancy well into their second and third month because they think, oh, no, that's 
that's and that's called an implantation bleed. And it's because of the enzymes are already digesting part of the endometrium and then some of the blood gets out. And then, you know, uh, maybe future mommy is starting to think like, oh, no, that's just my period. I'm OK. Then they start eating. Then they start weight gain. And then the mood swings. Then you start realizing, oopsies, I think I'm pregnant. Endometrium goes, surrounds the blastocyst, right? And then the endometrium will feed the blastocyst with all its arteries and veins. And of course, trophoblast, right? The outer cell, HCG. Now, another thing that HCG, have like in your notes a little HCG box. So what's in the HCG box so far? One, it maintains the corpus luteum. Therefore, it'll maintain progesterone. Progesterone, P, pregnancy. Another thing that HCG does is that uh, it actually shuts down a little bit of the immune system because um, it has to prevent the mommy's body from uh, viewing the blastocyst or that ball of cells as foreign body, okay? So, that's another thing that HCG does. It kind of shuts down the immune system in the area a little bit so that the blastocyst won't get attacked by mommy's immune system. Because remember, it's it's a foreign thing. It's coming from something else. Uh, um, sperm and egg is now something else. It's, an, it's not part of mommy. So now HCG will now suppress that. Now, the outer area... See the outer brown area? That's your trophoblast. Your trophoblast will eventually form the placenta. And that's the liaison or the go-between between, between mommy and baby. The placenta is extremely important because it's the only way that there's gas exchange and waste management for uh, the embryo. But we kind of know that there are certain things that cross over, uh, like, um, you know, viruses, the um, um, toxicology as well. If mommy's a drinker, baby's a drinker. If mommy loves doing crack, baby will love doing crack because um, the placenta is the go-between and it is in the trophoblast, this outer area right here. Okay, and where's the baby? Inside, this blue thing. Okay. Excuse me, Dr. Mm -hmm. Garayas. You said yeah. it's gas exchange and what? Well, uh, all this gas exchange and waste management, because of course I have gas exchange, CO2 and O2 has got to go in and out, but the baby will also make metabolic waste. So mommy has to go get rid of it, right? Because baby can't, baby's inside, right? Baby's, our future baby is going to be inside this thing here. So uh, see where uh, the microvilli are starting to go into the endometrium? that's eventually gonna be like arteries and veins that are gonna connect into baby. And we're gonna show that in about 20 slides or so. Here's a better view of uh, the trophoblast and how you could see it invades in with the little feet and little fingers. The little fingers are called microvilli and the little feet are called podocytes. And it's gonna dig because it wants to get to these reservoirs here where there's arteries and veins. And that's what's going to perform gas exchange and waste management for the future fetus, which is here in blue. Oh, uh, nice picture. Now, let's talk about the layers because of the extra embryonic membrane. So it's not the embryo, it's on what's outside the embryo, right? And we're also gonna talk about how the placenta gets formed. So the trophoblast has a, a set of uh, layers and the outermost extra embryonic layer of the trophoblast is called your chorion, right? Now the chorion is important because those where we had the chorionic villi and the little feet and the little fingers that will start invading here. So the chorion is in brown, right? And it's gonna start invading with the uh, uh, microvilli, so that's chorion, that's outside. Now, lacunae, there are a whole bunch of spaces, right? And they have enzymes, they have blood. Uh, lacunae is just what? 
faces. And of course, the, 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 the trophoblast will eventually turn into the what? Placenta, okay? Um, now, the inner membrane. So we look at this thing. There's an outer set of cells, right? Which is like these. And then there's an inner set of cells. Now, the inner set of cells are called the amnion. The amnion are the thing that's going to pro directly protect the future fetus. So chorion, you're going to think what? That's going to dig into the, um, into the endometrium. But the amnion is the inner layer that's going to be most intimate with what? The embryo. Okay. Now within the amnion, there's going to be amniotic fluid. The fluid is really great because it's a protective function. It's cushion. And the neat thing about having fluid all in there is that it'll keep the baby warm. Okay. And we need the baby to be warm because remember, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is optimal for metabolic function. And the baby has to grow and needs the most optimal uh, temperature. So you got amniotic fluid inside the amniotic sac, and it's going to cushion baby. And I've told you guys some horror stories uh, about what happened to some of my pregnant patients. Baby was fine. Um, we're talking a uh, multi-car accident, gunshot, uh, boyfriend kicked her down the stairs, you know, all these horrible things. But the amniotic fluid provides protection cushions the uh, embryo and has this wonderful temperature for what purpose? For metabolic reactions. And therefore, because when we do amniocentesis, we, we can analyze the fluid for a whole bunch of metabolites and things that are going on. Okay, and of course the amniotic sac, uh, there, these things are membranes. Now, what is this yolk sac, allantois, and then we're going to talk about the placenta. So the yolk sac, right, I want you to think what? It's going to form blood cells. That's what's really important about the yolk sac. And the allantois will be the connecting of these blood cells, right, it goes uh, to help form the umbilical uh, cord with the umbilical vessels. So yolk sac, I want you to think in the outer layer of blood cells. And the allantois, because uh, that's going to be uh, the, um, the future umbilical cord. So put that in your notes. Yolk sac, external blood vessels uh, on blood cells. But the allantois is definitely the umbilical cord that has the umbilical vessels. The placenta, we already know. That's going to be um, the go between between baby and mommy. And there is a membrane uh, uh, that acts kind of like a filter. But unfortunately, a lot of nasty things like viruses and, and drugs get through. But, a lot, but it, 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 it serves its purpose. But uh, I guess when uh, the space aliens were making us, uh, they didn't think of crack cocaine or HIV. So let's look at this. What does this look like? So you see the yolk sac of the embryo? It's here. And they call it a yolk sac because it's, you know, it's like a yolk of the egg. And of course, the outer layer is the uh, uh, chorion. The inner layer is the amnion with the amniotic fluid, right? You have this amnion here, amniotic fluid, because who's going to be the baby? This is going to be the baby. OK, now, of course, connecting stalk. Uh, is going to um, uh, part of your allantois, and your allantois is going to eventually become your umbilical cord. All right, now inside here, in between the amnion and the yolk sac, what you have in here are what they call the germ cell layers, or the and germ in um, in developmental biology doesn't mean like bacteria. Germ layers mean like uh, growth layers. So you have the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. These things are going to be the layers of this future human being, right? And you can see how it like connects and you have the connecting stalk and you can now see the allantois is gonna start forming the, um, uh, the umbilical cord. 
And then of course the inner cell mass, right? Which is the future fetus. And then the outer cell mass will be part of the placenta. You can see it's kind of growing already. Mm, no one understand. Oh, we're going to talk about umbilical arteries, umbilical veins, but just notice real quick. Look at the arteries. They're colored blue. Umbilical arteries are deoxygenated. Umbilical veins are oxygenated. So just like your pulmonary circuit, it's backwards. And it's backwards because mommy, mommy circulation is adult. It's considered forward. And if backwards and forwards get together via this uh, placenta. Now, what are these germ cell layers? Let's see. Uh, here you go. Here's a picture of it. The germ cell layers turn into things. So, what does the ectoderm or the outer cell do? If you look here, uh, slide 20, ectoderm, what big is what? Think nervous system, integumentary system. So nervous system, integumentary system. Mesoderm, I want you to think what? Everything in the middle, muscles, bone, blood. And of course, wherever there's blood, there's gotta be lymphatic vessels. I want you to also add any of the reproductive organs, kidneys, uh, um, and of course the inner epithelial lining. So that's everything in the middle, mesoderm. And the endoderm, I want you to think more of uh, uh, GI, right, which is gastrointestinal tract, your respiratory tract, and of course your uh, urinary tract, what sands your kidneys, okay? Because remember, your kidneys are located retroperitoneally. So it doesn't, it doesn't um, um, belong in the separation between the urinary bladder and the urethra, okay? So those are your germ cell layers. These are the things that, um, it's the future child. And anything that messes with these layers uh, that will cause um, uh, malformations or problems with your DNA, which is the blueprint of who you are, and that's called the teratogen. Gen means creation of, terato means birth defect or malformation. So if you have a teratogen with ectodermal, by ectodermal origin, you're gonna have what? You're gonna have a nervous system problem, you're gonna have an integumentary system problem. If you have a teratogen in your mesodermal cells, it'll be what? Muscle, bone, blood. Endodermal cells, you're gonna think GI your gen and your genital urinary tract, specifically urinary bladder and urethra. This is the embryo. These little things are called somites, these little boxes. And I named them because when we're looking at the ultrasound, we count them up uh, to see if a uh, baby's development. And remember, anything that has to do with timing, that's development. But the actual growth and multiplication of cells, it's um, on um, the number and size of cells, that's growth. Development, I want you to think timing. You can see all of us, we didn't look human. Look like a lizard. I guess that's why people believe there's lizard people walking around. But yeah, never. Who do I? Who do I know? Okay, let's look at development. How am I in time? I'm cooking. All righty. Now, of course, the inside, right? And this is the amniotic sac with the amniotic fluid. Because uh, with the future baby growing here, the umbilical cord, right, which is then going to connect into the placenta here. The placenta is the go-between between mommy and baby. Now, weeks um, um, like six through nine in um, in obstetrics and uh, developmental biology is crucial because that's where you have what they call organogenesis or the creation of your organs. And you can see here, look at, uh, in the first month, month and a half, so that's the week six through uh, week nine, look at your heart, limbs, eyes, ears, and reproductive system, right? They're all kicking in, right? But what will happen uh, to the nervous system? Nervous system keeps on developing. And remember, 
it develops long after the age of six, but it like peaks at age five, age six. So that's why I'm always promoting like, yeah, teach your kid as much as you can, make them learn eight languages. Uh, yeah, let them do calculus at the age of five, do whatever. Because I don't, I goes, um, I have this lovely development I want to take advantage of. Um, and those of us who are adult learners, remember when we were kids, it was so much easier to remember things. But as an adult, it's difficult to even remember where my keys are. Now, you see these teratogens? Look where they affect things. Week zero through month two, they could easily mess with anything. And Accutane, uh, diethyl sylvestrol, very popular. But thalidomide in the 70s, look at that. Messes, messes exactly with the upper and lower limbs. Uh, thalidomide. Uh, was marketed as a birth control pill in Europe in the late 60s, early 70s. And the horrible part was um, initial testing looked good. It worked. The drug worked, so they brought it to market. But then they started noticing that if mommy was on thalidomide and then wanted to have a child, um, their child would have no, uh, no hands or uh, no, no arms or legs. They'd have like little flipper hands and little flipper feet. Um, and um, uh, that's the side effect of thalidomide. And that is all, things like thalidomide is also the reason why here in the United States, it takes forever to get a drug approved because they just want to make sure that there's no dangers or no future dangers and no liabilities so, um, somewhere, down, uh, somewhere down the road. So let's, Go back so we can uh, identify. Uh, this is the uh, while we're all talking about this stuff, this stuff gets away from us. So you have the pre embryonic stage. So that's this slide. I want you to think what? Like microscopic uh, cellular. Now, he goes, uh, when are we going to have the uh, embryonic stage, right? Because the embryonic stage is when there's membrane formation. So when we start talking about the chorion and amnion, that's what? That's the embryo already, okay? And then further and further development, right, uh, will eventually develop into the last part, right? This embryo, keep on going. It'll then bring, a, uh, bring us to fetal stage. And remember I told you organogenesis was like somewhere between week six and week nine. Well, by, the, by week nine, uh, the fetus, now we don't call it embryo anymore. We now call it the fetus because now it has all its systems in play, right? You'll have the heart rate, growth is very rapid. And if you noticed um, uh, the other picture, and also, you notice toddlers, their head is really big, right? Because why? Remember, the development of the brain is uh, um, um, starts along with all the other development, but just keeps on going. And again, the importance of your central nervous system. Uh, and uh, 12th week, external reproductive organs, fourth week, you don't need to... Uh, you don't need to know specifically these uh, um, milestones, but if I mentioned them, you know that this is development. Think timing, development, and uh, growth. I want you to think number and size of cells. But if I start talking in weeks, months, this is development. Okay, and you can see here. See how big kids' heads are, right? especially their newborn, but then what happens, right? What gets uh, what gets big when they're toddlers? Look at their stomachs. Got these little pot bellies because remember, they're eating a lot. Um, uh, I remember when my kids were like at that age, they just, they just ate everything. And that means their GI is now really, really uh, ramping up for uh, ramping up for development. Remember what I mentioned before? We all started off as um, 
uh, both male and female. So everybody on the call, everybody on this planet started off like this. We didn't have penis, nor did we have a clitoris. We had this stuff. And you don't need to memorize this, to, but no one understand that. It goes once, uh, like, you know, week four, week five, uh, start kicking in. Then there's going to be formation of external reproductive organs secondary to the response of your primary sexual characteristics. So if my patient is XY chromosome, they're going to go down the Wolfian pathway and this genital, genital tubercle and the urogenital fold will start developing into the glans penis and uh, the penis shaft. But for uh, if it is the patient is XX chromosome, right, female, they'll go down the malarian pathway and um, instead of developing a glans penis, it'll be what? Head of the clitoris, right? And then uh, uh, urethral groove, labia majora, labia minora, and the vaginal orifice started to started to form. Okay. So the big thing here is uh, for like uh, also for um, Thursday's exam, homolog for male and female, think penis and clitoris, they're homologs of each other, right? Because they both were the same thing when we all started. And here is now full grown placenta, umbilical cord with the umbilical vein being uh, being uh, oxygenated, umbilical artery being deoxygenated. The baby is in uh, what they call vertex position or head first. And remember, we were talking about uh, the sacrum. Look at that. Nice and and it's going to be nice and secure because it has all bunch of ligaments there to make sure none of this gets torn up. Okay. Fetal circulation, okay. Um, it's a common joke in obstetrics uh, to call the fetus uh, or the embryo um, parasite because it is. And one of the things that makes mommy uh, typically anemic and tired is because baby's hemoglobin has 30% more affinity to oxygen than adults. So it will grab a lot of your O2. And of course, umbilical vein, we're going to think what? Oxygenated. Now, your fetal circulation is backwards. So there are three holes. The ductus venosus, foramen ovale, you know, for means hole, ductus means like, um, you know, like a tunnel, like a pathway, and you also have the ductus arteriosus. Okay, so things are backwards in the fetus, and let's see this picture. Here. Okay. So there are three holes that are open when baby is still uh, in the uterus with mommy, and Let's talk about each one of those holes. Can I draw on this thing? Let me draw it. Wow, why is this so slow? No. Um, where's my cutting tool? What's it called? Snip it. Snip. Snip it. Snip and sketch. Because I need to new. Yep, there it is. So let me grab this. And then. Let's put it in here. Why won't I mean? Take a new snip, which I did. Did it right here. All right, there you go. Okay. 
Thank you for your ongoing patience. So let's look at the three holes. So the first hole is called your ductus arteriosus. Right now, your ductus arteriosus is in between your aorta and your pulmonary trunk. Now we know the pulmonary trunk is supposed to be blue, but the aorta is supposed to be red, but we see it's purple. That means the blood is mixing because there's a connection in between, hence the term ductus arteriosus, between your aorta and your uh, pulmonary trunk, also known uh, that's connected to your, of course, your pulmonary arteries. So that's your ductus arteriosus. And when uh, baby's still inside mommy, that is open, okay? The next one is the uh, foramen ovale. Where's the... Your foramen ovale is, um, if you'll notice here, do you notice the uh, the right side is of course blue, but the left side of baby's heart is also purple. So it's not quite red. It's supposed to be red, but again, this is fetal circulation. It's backwards. So the foramen ovale opens up the space in between the left atrium and then the right atrium. So that's the foramen ovale. And last but not least, the ductus venosus. And of course, that's going to be in between two veins. Which vein? Right? Your inferior vena cava and your umbilical vein right here. Right? Remember, your umbilical vein is oxygenated. And then you have your inferior vena cava here. And there's, you can see the purple. There's mixing of blood. So to recap, the ductus arteriosus is a connection in between your pulmonary artery and your uh, aorta here. Your foramen ovale is in between your left atrium and right atrium here. And your ductus venosus is in between, is in a connection in between your um, uh, pulmonary vein right here and your inferior vena cava. So you could see in all three situations, there's mixing of blood. In all three situations, things that are supposed to be red are purplish. So there's mixing of blood. So I could ask you, which one is which? And those are the three holes. And the second baby's born, when the baby starts crying, what happens? All those holes, in theory, should what? Close. And if they all close, then baby's circulation will look just like an adult, just like mommy's circulation. Okay? okay? And that's why we pinch off this cord here, right, of the um umbilicus, and then we do what? Send this to patho, and we'll tell you uh, what are we looking at in the placenta momentarily. Okay, so that's slide 30, pretty good. Talks about fetal circulation, umbilical vein versus umbilical artery, and the three holes, the three foramen. Okay, remember our HCG box? Well, we're going to add a couple more things to the HCG box. Let's add, it also inhibits um, FSH and LH, okay? Because do you need ovulation when you're pregnant? No. So it will inhibit FSH, LH. So let's look at our box of what's, what human chorionic gonadotropin is. One, it's from the trophoblast, from the support cell. They're called brown, right? Two. Is there a good diagnostic tool to tell us what? You're definitely pregnant, okay? Three, does it maintains the corpus lute luteum, which means what's gonna get maintained? Progesterone, right? Progesterone, P, pregnancy. And then the fourth thing that we now just added, it's gonna inhibit FSH and LH, okay? Which is ovulation, because do you need ovulation when you're pregnant, okay? And then uh, after a couple of months, placenta starts messing with the estrogen and progesterone levels, again, to maintain progesterone, to maintain P for pregnancy. Another thing that goes on when you're pregnant, of course, you're gonna have placental lactogen. Once the placenta is up and running, it's going to uh, secrete the hormone lactogen. Why? 
because lacto means milk, gen means creation of. The breast and mammary glands have to develop, okay? And they not only de uh, develop uh, the function to make milk, they're going to get what? Engorged, they're gonna get bigger, right? So there is growth and development secondary to lactogen. Now, we learned another hormone, uh, if you recall the anterior pituitary, it was prolactin. Do not confuse lactogen with prolactin. Lactogen is for the development. Prolactin, pro means what? Milk letdown reflex, okay? Uh, that's the thing that's going to uh, promote the secretion of the milk for baby. So placental lactogen, I want you to think what? Stimulates breast and mammary gland development. Another thing uh, that uh, also happens during pregnancy, we have oxytocin that will um, ramp up or stimulate uterine contractions, but we also have relaxin that will do what to the uterine contraction? Inhibit it, okay? Because you can't just have push, push, push all day. Eventually it has to relax. Aldosterone, we already know. Sodium and water retention. Parathyroid hormone, we already know. Dr. Grice, uh, I have a question. Yep, shoot. So um, this relaxin, you says it stops. So yep. this means, um, does this stop like the uh, negative feedback? This is what stops the negative feedback? I thought remember, the baby coming remember out. Remember with oxytocin, it's positive feedback, right? It's what? Foot on the pedal, keep on going, right? But what, because what is the thing that's going to stop the positive feedback? It's relaxing. So think relaxing, things inhibit uterine contraction. Don't think positive, negative, just think inhibits uterine contraction. That means what? The, goes, uh, um, the, the contractions after baby's born should, uh, uh, should eventually stop because of what hormone? Relaxin, and it's even built right in the, the name. It's telling your uh, uterus to do what? Relax. And we already know aldosterone and parathyroid hormone to death, or, or I hope we do, or we, I hope we know it by Thursday, because these two things are super big. I think I asked five uh, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone questions, four or five of them, something like that. Of course, growth of uterus displaces abdominal organs. That's why mommy vomits. Also, there's heartburn, urinary frequency, because if you're pushing, remember, you're pushing on that detrusor muscle, what's gonna happen? You're gonna pee more. More oxygen, because we already learned about he fetal hemoglobin is much more powerful, powerful, so mommy's gonna get tired, what, quicker, faster. But, uh, and everything's gonna get ramped up in general because mommy needs more oxygen. And of course, mommy is now eating for two, right? So of course, food intake must also be increased. But remember, not increased to the point of obesity. Actually, um, more than half my patients, I, I actually had to um, tell them to slow it down with, with their intake uh, because there's a, nice, there's a nice chart you'll learn of obstetrics of proper, um, uh, proper weight gain during pregnancy. And uh, in case in and out of good diet, maternal body. And, and also, I can tell you right now, um, the better shape that mommy is in, the better uh, the, uh, the day of, of parturition or the day of pregnancy um, where, the, where you know, a uh, baby goes out, it's, it's night and day. Um, I've always told the story about how my wife wasn't really in shape for the, her first two pregnancies. And then in between the pregnancies, she became a, a dance instructor. Her last set of pregnancies were so easy. I mean, well, relatively, relatively, because the first and second one was, oh, that was rough. Um, but um, subsequent, so what, what are we promoting during prenatal care? Preparation, getting the patient in shape, getting the patient ready to, uh, to push and breathe. Now, parturition, we already talked about, uh, that's what? 38 to 40 weeks when the contractions start, that's called parturition, right? When, this is how I remember it. It's when the uh, uh, baby
baby and mommy get to part ways, right? Of course, there's going to be a decrease in progesterone, increase in prostaglandin. Uh, why do we care about prostaglandin? We care about it because remember we talked about prostaglandin is the key to opening up the cervix. Because actually prostaglandins makes the cervix nice and thin and soft because we need the cervix to open, right? And of course, decrease in progesterone is now going to start releasing what? Oxytocin. Oxytocin is the only example of positive feedback that we have. But, but what do we need to know regarding oxytocin? It is uterine contraction and it'll keep on going until when? Until baby is out, not only until baby's out, until after his baby out when um, we, mommy also has to deliver the placenta as well. Fetus is typically uh, uh, positioned head down, but they can be positioned, uh, you know, feet first or breech. It's not, it's not uncommon, right? Strong contractions from the myometrium, the middle layer of uh, the uterus. And of course, uh, birth canal or the passageway, cervix, vaginal canal, and of course the uh, outer introitus, which is the vulva. Uh, placenta. Now, uterus is called, and all the all the other uh, stuff that comes after it is called afterbirth because it's after what? So, it in many obstetric textbooks, it's called the second delivery. So the first delivery, of course, is going to the fetus. And then we got to do what? Then placenta. I love first time mommies because when baby comes out, they're so they're so relieved. But I got to remind mommy, it ain't over because I got to get this out. Because remember that HCG, the second progesterone starts dropping, oxytocin starts increasing, and then estrogen starts happening. Well, guess what? The placenta and any uh, leftover um, fetal parts will now be considered foreign body and mommy is going to start attacking it. That's why we have to um, make sure the entire placenta is complete and out. And you can see here, and you can see the passageway. See, it's like a little ramp. And you can see how uh, the cervix and the uterus have to be well aligned. If you have a retrograde cervix, that means the cervix is pointing either down here or up here. Baby's going to get trapped. And there's all this timing, okay, for all this stuff to happen. And then the second part is what? We pull a little bit of traction on the umbilical cord, and then we can um, then have to remove the placenta. And we will look at it on Friday, what the placenta looks like. And there's these things called cotyledons. It's like this big meat puzzle. And you have to get all the pieces or mommy's going to now have an immune reaction to anything that got left over in there. Because now HCG is not there to immunosuppress the area. Prolactin, we already know. Anterior pituitary gland, that's old news. Placental lactogen, we already know. First milk is called colostrum. Lots of proteins, but what's it really about? Antibodies. That's what it's really about because baby has no uh, secondary immune system, has no adaptive immune system. Therefore, these antibodies, even if mommy is not interested in uh, providing milk for baby, we tell mommy just for the first couple of days or so, because we need to get these antibodies in. It's nice, okay? And of course, oxytocin will also aid in the milk letdown reflex. What is also part of the milk letdown reflex? Prolactin, right? Baby starts uh, suckling, right? Um, the, um, the the tissue around the areola and the nipple are quite sensitive, so it'll send uh, messages to the anterior pituitary to do what? Release prolactin. And uh, this reflex is so powerful. We already mentioned it before that um, there are times when mommy, all she has to do is hear a baby, any baby, or just think about um, breastfeeding and the milk letdown reflex will happen. Now, breastfeeding, of course, right? You will not ovulate for uh, several months because uh, uh, while there's breastfeeding, 
there's still uh, there's still innovation of FSH and LH um, uh, um, by prolactin, but everything else is in play, right? Um, so, um, but that only it doesn't happen for everyone. Uh, I've I, I've had some patients they got pregnant almost immediately. That's why um, you can you can pretty much get pregnant in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we always uh, we always tell mommy and especially daddy six to eight weeks stay away from each other um, because number one mommy needs to heal. Number two mommy also needs to have all her hormones go back to normal. Um, and um, having children one after the other like that is also um, leads to some high risk issues. And especially if mommy had any um, gestational issues like diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, any of that stuff. Um, we want to give mommy a break to recover. Okay. So that is, uh, um, what do you call that? The, the process of fertilization to 40 weeks. Let us take a nice 10 minute and um, um, let me see. Yeah. Um, I guess I. Yeah, let's just take a minute. I guess I'll just let this um, just keep it recording. And if let me find a timer. And I'll be back in 10 minutes. And you can shoot some questions here in the chat. Uh, or uh, later on, um, you can also shoot me an email as well. All right, see you guys in 10. Okay, looks like I got full boat. Wonderful, wonderful. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. President Conifor, Dr. Garayas, I think you forgot to start your timer.
there's one timer going on the other um on the other side. It says six minutes and thirty nine seconds. Like under the you, Google link. What are you still doing here, Ty? <laughs> You're on break. <laughs> Thank you, girl. You're welcome.
Okay, and we are back. All right, where did we leave off? Now we have to talk about uh, oh, the bad part when you're born, human lifespan. So this is now the postnatal period. So this is after parturition, after the day, uh, date of confinement, right? And uh, it is now birth until death. So of course, there, uh, you're gonna learn in greater detail uh, in your developmental classes. I don't know which one's which. But the postnatal period, you have, of course, the neonatal, neonatal period. Now, this is also important for, um, um, what do you call that, medical follow-ups. Infancy, again, continuation of um, uh, the milestones. And, goes, and of course, childhood into adolescence for the school years. And then uh, adolescence, the big thing about adolescence is, of course, puberty, adulthood, and uh, when you get old enough to know that you are about to die, right? And that's senescence, okay? So let's go over some of these things. So there's always a follow-up period, um, at least two visits to obstetrics and pediatrics within uh, the first four weeks of life, because this is the neonatal period. This is when we can, might see things, right? And did you notice? they mentioned respiration first, especially with the newborn patient, right? Um, and they're just starting out, okay? Now, uh, their first breath, of course, is so powerful that it uh, closes up those uh, three uh, holes or foramen, the foramen ovale, ductus arteriosus, and the ductus venosus. So we don't need to uh, smack babies on the bottom anymore. Uh, they did away with that in the, um, I think the late 70s, early 80s. Now, the big thing about respiration in this four weeks is, especially for the neonatal uh, period, is uh, um, for the um, premature infant, the thing that we're most concerned about is their breathing, surfactant, right? Now, the function of surfactant is to reduce surface tension. Surface tension is required in your alveoli to uh, for gas exchange, right? But again, too much tension, it'll start um, it'll start changing the um, the osmotic pressure gradient. So it requires surfactant, and this is scary stuff. Um, well, it isn't anymore because we now have uh, surfactant injections now um, uh, that uh, that help us, especially with a premature infant. But think surfactant s surface tension, right? And it is directly related to how well the alveoli perform gas exchange, which is also known as respiration, right? Colostrum, the first milk, remember it got a lot of energy in it, but what's really great about um, uh, the, the milk is that it has antibodies. Remember that uh, passive natural immunity that mommy provides baby? And of course, you know, urine, temperature control, everything takes a couple of days to kick in, sometimes even a, a week or two, right? And that is part of the neonatal period, the end of four weeks. Cardiovascular changes, we already know, right? Now, infancy, that's about uh, one year, and it gets broken down into six months and uh, 12 months and 18 months for uh, pediatrics. This is, of course, growth rate is high, uh, eruption of teeth, teething, right? Um, and we're gonna have now movement. And the movement is going to get increasingly coordinated. Especially, you know, when they start, uh, um, when they start running around and walking around, then, and then when they were able to uh, grasp things then you'll have your social smile. So the social smile is, God, I gotta look up my milestones. I think they're good at end of second month. Okay, end of the first month. So, right, uh, your baby might have been smiling the day they were born, but that's just probably gas, 
but the social smile and laughing and appropriate laughing, uh, well, semi-appropriate because, you know, babies laugh at the oddest thing, right? But you can now see some signs and symptoms of communication. Like uh, um, many mothers and parents know that um, there's certain cry, like, oh, that's a tired cry, or that's, um, that's a hungry cry, or that's just being needy and annoying cry. Right, you you get those of us who are parents, you can you can just easily tell, and of course proteins, calcium, vitamin D, which relates to calcium, right? Uh, iron, which relates to hemoglobin, vitamin C, C, think collagen, right? So these are the things that um, we're looking at in infancy. So it was about one year, okay. Now what happens in uh, childhood, right? And that's the school years. OK, um, and it's more about a lot of the social and mental stuff where you're going to learn in uh, your, uh, I believe you guys have a psychiatry class or a, a couple of psychology lectures, right? So the, the maturation during childhood, uh, one of the bigger things is um, appropriate play and uh, appropriate communication skills. And um, that's why if uh, if ever you've met um, like uh, only children, some of you are only children, or some of you who've been homeschooled, they're a little bit socially different. Um, because again, like if you, if the child hasn't been exposed uh, to a lot of school, then uh, um, they will, they will, they will act diff uh, different. I'm always having the promotion of uh, kids actually going to school and I and especially pre-K and kindergarten, first and second grade, the child really they can learn all of that from YouTube. But what they're really learning is their communication skill and maturation of emotions. They they start to learn in school how to listen and how to control themselves. Okay, and that's childhood. I want you to think, um, you know, grade school years. Now, adolescence. That's the puberty to adulthood. Okay. That's when you have your secondary sexual characteristics, um, uh, hormonal control, and um, nowadays with the hormonal control or non-control of your hormones, there could it's like the it's also the beginning of mental disease and defect, um, and uh, the effects of hormones as well. Growth spurts, uh, increased appetite because if you're growing, you're going to need more energy. Okay. Uh, intellectual abilities, all of that is, of course, what? I don't know about emotional maturity when I was an adolescent, but uh, hey, I guess if they write it down, they did. But the big thing for adolescence is puberty, right? Starts to becoming reproductively functional and secondary sexual characteristics uh, start ramping up for the good and bad. Now, adulthood, right? You peak in your 20s, unfortunately. OK, like uh, that's why I, I, I giggle at articles like you know, 50 is the new 30. No, it is not. 20 is the new 20. Um, but if you take care of yourself, you're going to re retain the majority of that function in uh, in later years. OK, now it goes. What else happens in uh, adulthood? Metabolic rate decreases significantly. Um, that means you're not as uh, like if you were in shape in your 20s, uh, it's going to take more effort, both diet and exercise wise, wise to maintain that same uh, uh, that same uh, strength or at least like 80 percent of the strength. Like the the other day, like when I was in my 30s, I, I, um, because I was training regularly, but now I'm in my 50s, it's just I don't know. This is just really, really hard to even do even half of what I used to be able to do. But that's adulthood, and that's that's a that that's okay, right? Because um, with decrease of uh, of course muscle mass and muscle strength, because if you have the kind of job and we're all in healthcare that uh, that you're you're constantly reviewing and you're you're constantly using your mind. All of these things like dementia and um, uh, you know all these um, in, increased in, increased susceptibility to mental disease and defect um, after your 40s, 
they actually there's uh, reports now from the American Psychiatric Association, a major depressive or disorder. There's peaks at like age 12, 13, and also late 20s. And and in theory, they used to think that you know you go to graduate school in your late 20s, and um, that's when you know uh, you know the reality of being an adult kicks in. Um, and of course, height decreased because what uh, what else you have? You also have um, uh, increased osteoclast, in, uh, greater bone resorption. Therefore, um, what do you call? It? Um, you know, you just shrink. Now, what's the senescence? Okay, there's a point in in your life when you get old enough that you're going to start noticing that you can't um, recover, right? Like when you're younger, in your 20s and 30s, even if you took very good care of yourself and you're in your 40s, you can offset some of those degenerative changes by being active and, 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 and all this. But your body becomes less and less able to cope uh, physically, right? You're, and then you have wear and tear. Um, and um, remember all those slides that I never go over? Because everything is what declining, and you have to admit that this weighs on your patient. And of course, another thing about uh, senescence as well. Now that I'm having more friends who are like older and having their empty nesters, right? It's just it like even though we complain about work and kids, when your work becomes less or when you've already wired your job, life becomes boring, extremely boring. Right. And then when the kids aren't around, even worse. There's, and there's like nothing to do and it becomes very lonely. So you can now see how senescence you have these, you start noticing degenerative changes. Uh, you start noticing things hurt more. You start noticing you can't do more things. Right. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's progressive. But if you know about senescence and this process, and you take care of yourself, then um, um, a lot of these things can be mitigated, especially the uh, mental health aspect. Of it. And, and we're in healthcare, so um, hopefully you'll have a nice, fruitful career where you're never going to be bored. Life expectancy, it's called the graying of America. Uh, this number is even increased now. Um, let's see what life expectancy is currently. Yep, 77 now. Okay, and that's uh, for a male, it's around 73.5 and uh, 73.2, give or take. Uh, and uh, women, it's... Uh, uh, 79. Okay. And also another thing about the senescence is, is that I'm now having a growing pop. Like when you get older, it's when the world starts taking things away from you. You know, I, I'm, my wife went to another wake, uh, the other night and, you know, it seems like that's all we're going to is a lot of funerals and a lot of wakes when you get older. Right. But again, if, if you know how to handle senescence and also keep your mind active and keep your mind, you know, uh, and this is coming from a consummate pessimist, to keep your mind positive, especially in a very negative world, that's really rough to do. But if you can do that and uh, and 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 have a a job that you can at least tolerate, you don't have to love your job, but if you can at least tolerate it and it doesn't eat you up, that's a pretty darn good thing. So it's called the graying of America. Now it's good news for us. We'll have a job for days, or we'll always have a job forever. But the issue is, is now that people are living way past eighty, right? Uh, a lot of people are because remember the average was what seventy nine uh, something uh, for female. So that means they're they're going to be living longer, and they're going to be having more uh, physical and mental issues. Because remember, it's not only the body we have to uh, take in consideration, it's the mind. Um, and uh, medical advances, the more advanced medical stuff, the more expensive it is. Expensive. What am I? 
Who was that? The expensivist? What was that guy? Oh, I'll figure it out later. Oh, by the way, see this? This is in 2014. It's the same. Heart disease, cancer, chronic. And if you look at them, uh, heart disease is what? Preventable. Low respiratory, preventable. Injuries, preventable. Stroke, preventable. Diabetes, preventable. Influenza and pneumonia, preventable. There's nephritis, nephrotic syndrome, and nephrosis, preventable. Mental health, preventable. Do you see a lot of this? You can, if you took care of yourself, it goes, it, it, uh, um, uh, you know, the consequences of you getting older would be far less. Now, the function isn't to live to like 150, but the function is to live in your later years with a better quality of life. And that's what we're trying to get to our patients. Uh, what happens? Um, again, how your, how's your head at? Um, belief in circumstance. Not necessarily a belief in an organized religion, but more of a belief in yourself um, and, and then a belief in like, and have some level of hope that, hey, tomorrow's another day, right? And especially those of us who are chronically ill, it, it's, it's hard, especially if you, you're in healthcare, you know the statistics, it's hard not thinking about it, right? Um, uh, stages of dying. You're preactive and active, right? And you'll learn in your mental health, you know, the five stages, uh, Kluver, Busey, uh, you know, stages of death and dying. Uh, uh, well, uh, what was it? It was denial. Denial, anger. And just show it. Well, it you may have heard it before, but you can look it up. It's it's like denial, anger, bargaining, all all of these things. Like when you get really bad news, what's the first thing you start thinking about? Oh, that can't be me. Right? What's the next? Uh, what's the next thing? Depression. Like, oh my God, it's me. I'm gonna die. And then there's bargaining, right? Maybe some of you go pray, uh, or you say you put it up to the fates. Like, oh my God, if if my biopsy comes out um, benign, I swear to God, I'll never have a drop of alcohol ever again, right? And then, um, but my thing is about uh, the preactive dying process and the Kluver Busey stages. Why go through the stages? Just go right to acceptance. All right, I'm screwed. That's it. Right? And just accept your mortality. You can't live forever. Um, um, what was that thing uh, Tecumseh once said? Like, when it's your time, when it's your time to die, why cry about it? Accept it. And actually relish in it. Right? Now, active dying. Right? This is when it's already the decompensation stage, right? Uh, sleeps very often, very difficult, stupors, can't be awakened. Um, uh, these particular patients are already, they've already given up. So that's already uh, part of the uh, major signs and symptoms of major depressive disorder, right? Don't wanna use their brain anymore, don't care, right? Don't wanna eat. Um, it's called anhedonia. Uh, that's how you really know you like a lot of people say, oh, I'm depressed, but anhedonia is rough stuff. It's like anything pleasurable, you don't want to even touch. You don't care. So if there's absolutely nothing that gives you any more pleasure, uh, that's like appetite, um, um, you know, um, family, sex, um, that person is actively dying. And preactive is what? It's the stages that lead up to it. Okay. Um, that is that uh, for uh, this chapter. Let us now go to the next chapter. Oh, wow. It's fascinating. And look at these four ladies, totally unrelated. 
So let's look at genetics. Okay. Now, what is genetics? Well, genes are the DNA sequences, uh, and we know what DNA is. It is the blueprint of who you are. Means what? Everything. Even your behavior, right, uh, um, can be predicted to a certain extent, right? And we like genetics because it is something that's semi-predictable, okay? So let's say, for example, like um, the Grice family, all the men, uh, who smoke and who drink, uh, all of them get heart attacks before the age of 27. Okay, so that's semi-predictable. That's genetics. So what did I do? I purposely stopped smoking and kind of slowed down my drinking. Right? You can't. You know? Well, yeah, you can. And I've done it. So, but again, I knew that something, I may have inheritable traits Therefore, I should stop it. And actually, it was my wife's goal to have the kids not focus on food the way I focus on food. So that's why my kids, they drink, um, they drink juice that's cut with water. Like if they, but they usually drink water um, and they don't eat a lot of rice. And there's a reason, there's a reason for that because rice is what? It's, it's part of the Asian culture, but my wife knows it's also part of uh, the genetics that if you've got a lot of rice, you're going to have some heart disease, diabetes. Because remember I shared with you guys, um, the typical Asian rice, the sticky rice, is has a very high glycemic index. So if you know and understand that these things can be passed on, that means the DNA sequence for specific proteins can be passed on to somebody. Well, then we can start to predict it. And if we can predict it, we can start doing what? You start doing a set of behaviors to prevent it. Remember all, all those deaths, uh, the causes of death? They're all what? Like 80% of them are preventable. So gene is the actual DNA sequence, but the gene, genome is uh, like the uh, written language. Like what? what is, in, what is the... Um, so I want you to think genes is a DNA sequence, uh, but the genome is the letter representation of this sequence. And I'm going to show you examples of that. Um, we already know this part. DNA then goes to R, gets um, replicated, then goes to RNA, and then the RNA then goes to the um ribosome and makes protein we already know this okay oh i failed to mention this is the only chapter in anatomy physiology one and two that you have to know your um uh, your pathology so here's some terms genetics is of course the study of inheritance and its characteristics genes the actual dna sequence genome is the letters right a, G, C, T, A stands for adenine, guanine, cytosine, and T, thionine, and this is in DNA, okay? An exome is, um, is uh, what do you call it? It's, uh, it's not as important. It's, it, it's more, I, I know, how's this? Let's not look at exome, just look at genome set of genetic instructions, and the instructions are what? Letters. And these letters represent, um, what do you call that? Um, um, what are they? Not proteins. Uh, they represent, you know, the code of the DNA. Now, what's cystic fibrosis? This is our first disease. Cystic fibrosis, right? You need to know in every disease that we talk about, what its uh, mechanism of action. If you know the MOA of a disease, you could figure out its signs and symptoms. So defective chloride ion channel, okay? So if you have a defective chloride ion channel, what are you gonna get? You're gonna get thick mucus. So that means mucus, wherever there's mucus, it's gonna get gummed up. And where are the two places? lungs and your pancreas 
and I don't need my pancreas all gummed up, nor do I need my lungs gummed up. So right off the bat, you know they're going to have GI symptoms and they're going to have respiratory symptoms. So that is cystic fibrosis, defective chloride ion channel. And if they have defective chloride ion channel, you think they're also going to have some water balance problems. Yep. But the big thing is mucus problems. It's too thick. And that's cystic fibrosis. You could now see what the gene is. It's the order. And uh, the genome, the code, see these rungs of the ladder? That's the A, C, T, G. You know, we're going to talk about it in a minute. You see this little ball? That's a histone protein. It makes it super coiled. So this DNA sequence, you know, goes on and on and on and on. It now gets wound up here like a ball in this protein called histone. It starts winding up and super coiling it. And guess where it all ends up? It gets up in, into these chromosomes. And now you know, 2N, a complete human being, has what? 46 or 23 pairs of these things. And those are called chromosomes. And for cystic fibrosis, you need to know this, there's a loci or location on chromosome seven that's gonna mix up transcription translation and what did it do? It ruined the chloride ion channel. So you can try to do pathology this way, memorizing all the signs and symptoms, right? Or there's, you can try to figure out a way to know that chloride ion channels mess with mucus. So don't you think I'm gonna have a science problem? airway problem, my liver is going to get all blocked up, especially my bile ducts, my pancreas is going to get all blocked up, my intestines are all going to get blocked up, reproductive tract, doesn't, isn't there mucus in there too? That's all going to get blocked up, my skin, so doesn't, uh, don't I have a, a mucosal layer underneath skin? Don't you think it's now going to leach out salt? Yep, so these are Organs that are affected, these are some signs and symptoms. And remember the difference between signs and symptoms, especially for your project. A sign is something we all can see. For example, I can all see a report that says white blood cells increase, that's infection. I can actually see an ultrasound um, that shows me um, um, uh, polyps in my sinus. That's a sign. But what's a symptom, right? Uh, difficulty breathing. I don't know what that means. For one patient, it's just a little minor cough. For another patient, they could be on their deathbed, you know, barely can breathe in. So symptom is how the patient feels. A sign is what you definitely uh, see, like hard stools. I'm definitely going to see that, right? Um, and there's no real uh, sign for pancreas, but how about if they're having left upper quadrant pain upon eating? Well, isn't that a... Symptom, it's how my patient feels, okay? So mode of inheritance, this is going to be, I'm also going to have some uh, genetic uh, questions. Um, yeah, you can calculate, like, like, let's say, for example, if you have a spirometry reading, uh, uh, one of you asked, um, like you can calculate spirometry and spirometry is the measurement of breathing, right? But if my patient says, he goes, I cough at night and then he goes, I think I'm wheezing. Were you actually physically there to see any of that? No, so that's a symptom, right? Or, uh, you know, when the patient says to you, their, their vital signs are perfectly normal, but they'll tell you, I can't breathe. I'm having a hard time breathing, right? So difficulty breathing, dyspnea, in that respect, of course, is what? That's a symptom. But if the spirometry, if you said, oh, normal spirometry rating for a patient 70 kilograms should be 1.1 um, uh, liter or 1,100 cc's, a patient's running at 800, then that's not really a dyspnea. That's what? Their lung volume has changed or the lung, lung volume is decreased. And that is a what? That is definitely a sign. But if you physically heard them wheezing, right, you did your auscultation, that's also what? A sign, because your colleague can hear it. The nurse can hear it. The doctor can hear it, right? But um, think symptom, how the patient feels. 
signs and actual like diagnostic evidence of what's going on. Now, mode of inheritance prediction. Right, we're going to have some uh, uh, some uh, sample questions that we're going to do a little bit of math. Don't get excited, right? Uh, but um, uh, we're going to show you how different combinations of fertilization, how we can pretty much predict, and that's called mode of inheritance. Okay, so that's another thing you're going to need to know for every disease that we talk about. You have to know what is their mode of inheritance. And we're going to be discussing that as we go along. Karyotype. This is a karyotype. It is an actual uh, picture of your uh, 46 chromosomes. And you notice how many pairs you have. 23. 22 autosomal pairs and one bar body, which is your sex chromosome. And they call it bar body, named after some guy or gal named Barr, so that's a capital B-A-R-R, -R, and that's what we know as primary sexual uh, characteristic. So your sex chromosome or your 23rd chromosome or 23rd pair of chromosomes, that's your bar body. This is the thing that we can see is male or female. And do you see all these little lines? Those are uh, um, locations or loci, locus, means one area or one space or one place. Loci, L-O-C-I, means what? Multiple spaces, multiple places of location. And we already now know there's an exact point somewhere in chromosome 7 for cystic fibrosis. And you will now know that, that uh, cystic fibrosis is an autosomal disease because it's part of 1 through 22. But if you have an X-linked disease or a Y-linked disease, also known as a sex-linked disease. It will be where? 23rd chromosome. The problem would be here. Okay. And that is a uh, karyotype. Now, you have alleles. Everything's in pairs, right? So all the loci are in pairs. Okay. So let's Let's talk about what an uh, allele is and the word homozygous and heterozygous. Um, of course, pair 23, we're going to run over that. Here's an example. Um, where's my Microsoft? Blacked out there for a second. Okay. So allele, right, I want you to think they're pairs, okay? And you have a genotype, and we already know that's the code. So the genotype of an allele will look something like this. Uh, it could look like this, capital A, capital A, and that's what? Homozygous. Another homozygous is what? Lowercase a, lowercase a. That's also homozygous. And homo means what? The same. So you could have a code, capital A, capital A, that's one pair, a little, that's one allele, or one pair, and that's called homozygous. Lowercase a, lowercase a, that's also called homozygous. And then you're going to have this situation where you have one capital A, one lowercase a, and that's what? Now, there's no such thing in genetics as lowercase a capital A. We always write the more dominant one or the larger one here, like so. We don't write it with lowercase a uh, capital A like that. We write it like this. Now, what's this dominance thing that I'm talking about? Well, let's say there's a trait, and the actual trait called the phenotype. So the physical trait is what actually came out. Okay. So let's talk, uh, let's give, let's make up, um, so I can't talk about hair color and stuff like that because that's multi, that's, that's multiple alleles, uh, multiple genotypes. 
let's just let's just make something up. Um, let's say uh, A is uh, capital A. You're gonna think what? Um, the kid's gonna be athletic, and I'm just making this up. Now, of course, the lowercase a, they're non-athletic, right? So that's what, uh, I don't know, bookworm, okay. So let's look at the first one. Now, the a, anything capital is gonna be dominant. Anything lowercase, is going to be recessive. Now, with something's dominant, that means it will be larger and it will overshadow something that's recessive. Something, the word recessive means to recess, to, to step back, you know, to kind of hide away. So if we're looking at this, right, let's look at the uh, genotype and phenotype of these uh, three children. This one is going to be homozygous dominant. That's his genotype. That's the code. Capital A, capital A. Therefore, his physicality would be what? A, A. This person will be what? Athletic. Now, let's look at the homozygous recessive. There's no capital A in this equation. There's only lowercase a, lowercase a. So the lowercase a, lowercase a child, they won't be into athletic. They'll be into what? Um, they'll be bookish. They'll be, you know, for lack of a better term, nerdy. Okay. Now let's look at the third child. Capital A, lowercase a. This child is going to be athletic. Okay. So if we're just looking at straight up genetics, this child will be athletic because what got recessed? You know, the bookish, nerdy side. So the only the thing that got expressed in the phenotype, right? And let's uh, um, let's highlight these phenotypes. Phenotype is things that are physical, right? So athletic, bookish, nerdy, athletic. That's your phenotype. But what is the genotype? The code, the letters. And if the uh, genotype is a capital letter, it's going to overshadow the lowercase letter. And this is for complete dominance. This is for just regular dominance. Okay. So if I ask you, what is uh, what's the genotype? If you see two capital letters, you'll tell me it's homozygous dominant. What's the genotype of lowercase a, lowercase a? And you're going to tell me homozygous recessive. And if it is capital A, lowercase a, you're going to tell me. Um, uh, this child is heterozygous. And if it's complete dominance, meaning that the capital A will always get expressed if present, that means a homozygous dominant child will be just what? Purely athletic. A homozygous recessive child will be what? Purely what? Bookish, nerdy, anti-athlete. But the heterozygous child in a complete dominance situation, they're going to be what? athletic. And that's what a genotype is, code. Phenotype is what is the physical trait, what came out in the real world. So you could see here, you may have the genetics, but there's a, uh, that's a relative predictor of what may came, come out. But those of us who have been into athletics know that what? You can have the, you can have the genetics all day, every day. If you don't train, if the external doesn't uh, um, doesn't enhance the internal, and I can tell you right now, I can tell you right now, 
Um, my 16 year old is the nerdiest bookish thing in the world, but um, I trained her to run five miles a day. So she goes, not the most athletic kid I've ever known, but pretty, uh, 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 pretty athletic for a person whose default is uh, uh, sleeping and watching anime. Right. It's it's because uh, again, you could you could change genetics by changing the external behaviors. Right? But you could see how genetics is used as a predictor. So let's just imagine if bookish or nerdish was a disease or if athleticism was a disease. Right. You you could you could see the predictability of it. OK, so remember genotype, you're going to think what code phenotype starts with a pH physical. What physically will come out, and that's what's in yellow, and what's in blue, the code. And the description of the code is what? Homozygous dominant, if they're both capital letters. Homozygous recessive, if they're both lowercase. And heterozygous, if there's one capital letter, one lowercase. Okay. All right. So that's what that is. Dominance, recessive. Genotype versus phenotype. Remember, genotype, the, the actual letters that represents the pair of alleles. And the phenotype is what actually got expressed in real life, what came out. Okay. Because remember, you could have the genetics to be a genius, but if you didn't nurture it, it's not going to come out. So, how do we look at this predictability? Well, there are there's something called Mendelian inheritance or the inheritance of dominant and recessive things. And uh, that guy, Gregor Mendel, I think he was a monk or something like that. And monks, what do they have all day? They pray and then they mess with the garden. And uh, Gregor Mendel figured out how pea plants and and um, how roses cross pollinate. Right. And it was predictable on like what color peas and what color roses could come out. And that's what Gregor Mendel figured out. And the two tools that we use, we use Punnett squares and we use pedigrees. And the Punnett square, you probably saw this in, if you had other school, um, you probably saw Punnett square, uh, is this thing. If it's a square, you got daddy up here, mommy down here. We're gonna show you that in a minute, right? It is another example. And, but uh, pedigree looks like this thing, right? Um, uh, squares and circles. And you could tell who's daddy, mommy, uh, if it's full, if, if it's, um, what do you call that? Fully colored in, that means it's um, their homozygous dominant, right? And then it connects to their kids. Right. So that's what a pedigree. So Punnett square pedigree. So let us look at some uh, um, another uh, disease, and that disease is albinism. So what do we need to know? We need to know that the gene mutation deals with melanin. OK. Um, you have, um, if you're homozygous dominant yeah, and heterozygous, you're going to have normal melanin, normal skin. But if you have homozygous recessive, AA, you will be a what? An albino. And the possible combinations are uh, 25, 50%, and 24%. So let's look at how they figured this out. They did a what? A Punnett square. Okay. And they have genotypes, which are here, and the phenotypes, what came out. So first is, uh, and let me copy this. Let me copy it. I want to draw all of this.
C is no. All this has to be the hard way. Okay, I'll take this. Where's my snippet tool? Do snip and sketch. Oh, snapple. This. Then do snippet. Kind of have patience with me today. Ah. Oh. Why won't it let me skip it? All I want to do, I don't want to go. I'll move this out of the way and do this and this. There you go. Okay. Now we're cooking with gas. And make this a little bit little smaller so we can also. Okay. Now, how do you read a Punnett square? This is how you do it. First thing, first, you got to identify who mom and dad are. So, of course, these little spermies up here, that's dad. So, who is going to be always on top? Right? Dad. Who's always going to be here by your side? Mom. So you can see there's ova or oocytes. Now on the exam, I'm not going to tell you who's dad or mom. You're going to know that if you see his Punnett square, you see um, letters up top here. That means the letters here represent dad. The letters down here on the side represent mom. Now, if you'll notice, Dad has a capital A and a lowercase a. So dad is a what? He is a carrier. Now, how would I know that? Well, if I look at the kids, a capital A. Thank you. If I look at the kids, the capital A, lowercase a, or heterozygous is a normal carrier. Okay? So that means they're not going to have any signs or symptoms, but they're carrying the disease right there in that lowercase a. So dad is a what? He's a normal carrier. He doesn't have albinism, but he's carrying a recessive gene. Mom has capital A, lowercase a, so mom's just like dad. So mom is a what? Normal carrier. So that's one question. If I show you, um, of course, I'm going to erase oocytes. Let's see. No, I don't want to erase my stuff. Okay. So on a normal exam, will I have a little sperm and little eggs? No, it'll just be A here, capital A, lowercase a, capital A, lowercase a. The way you figure out what is the phenotype of dad, look at the kids. What's the phenotype of mom? Look at the kids. And we now know this is a union between heterozygous dad, heterozygous mom which are both normal carriers. So I could ask the question, right? Goes, uh, what's the genotype of dad? And you'll tell me heterozygous because it's capital A, lowercase a. What's the genotype of mom? Same, heterozygous. What's the, um, uh, what's the phenotype of dad? What physically came out? Dad's a what? Normal carrier. What's the phenotype of mom? Mom's a normal carrier. How about this kid? This kid, the genotype is homozygous dominant. What's his phenotype? Perfectly normal. These kids are just like mom and dad. These two kids, they are what? They're normal, but they're, they're both carriers. And who's the kid who got hit? The one with the lowercase a, lowercase a, or homozygous recessive. So this albino kid is a homozygous recessive. These two carriers are heterozygous. And this one normal kid is homozygous dominant. So we can now predict one kid out of four or 25% will be perfectly normal. Two kids out of four or 50% or one half will be what? Normal carriers. And again, one out of four kids will be will have the full-blown disease. Now, 
Another thing that you can also uh, learn from a um, uh, from a punnett square is what is the mode of inheritance? So who's the one who got sick? The kid with uh, the homozygous recessive, right? So, um, uh, what is the mode of inheritance? First, you pick, right? Um, uh, the kid who got sick, right? And that's this one. So, um, this is an autosomal disease because it's not sex linked or it's not X linked or Y linked. So, this disease mode of inheritance is called autosomal because it's one um, uh, it's on uh, one of the chromosomes between 1 through 22 so it's called autosomal recessive Oh, sweet Lord Almighty. I'm getting crampy just writing. Okay. So look at all the questions that you can see here. I could ask genotype, phenotype of either dad or mom or the kids. I could ask mode of inheritance, which for um, uh, which for albinism, which this is, remember, this is albinism. It's autosomal recessive. And I could also ask the... Um, um the ratios uh, what are the odds the kid's going to be perfectly normal non-carrier 25 percent what are the odds the kid is going to be uh, a carrier with no symptoms that's what 50 percent or two out of four there's there's only four kids here and two out of four so that's 50 percent and of course we already know one out of four will have the disease so that's what 25 percent So in this one big picture, you see how many questions I could ask? That's a ton. Okay. And of course, I can make this, well, you know, I really don't need to make it available because you guys can just pause the video. All right. So, cystic. Question, Dr. Garais. Yeah, shoot. Does that work? Is that the same way how the sickle cell traits work? Yeah, exactly. Oh. But um, we're going to talk about sickle cell in a minute because uh, right now we're talking about um, complete dominance, right? If you have a capital A, nothing should happen to you in albinism. But if you have a lowercase a, something will happen to you. In incomplete dominance, even if you have a capital A, something may happen to you. And that's sickle cell. That's what makes sickle cell a little bit different. And we'll, we'll get to that. So. We already had cystic fibrosis. If I already told you that cystic fibrosis is autosomal recessive, then you know it's going to act just like what? It's just going to act just like this. That means what? Um, if mom and dad are carriers, uh, one kid goes, one kid's going to be perfectly normal, two kids are going to be normal carriers, and then one kid um, uh, who has uh, recessive, um, um, autosomal recessive, recessive recessive genes, uh, that's the kid who's going to get sick. So knowing this model here, we can now predict for a cystic fibrosis patient, it's autosomal recessive disorder. That means the odds of their kid being perfectly normal, 25%. The odds of the kid being a normal carrier, 50%. But the odds of the kid being um, having the actual disease will be what? 25%. It'll act just like um, um, albinism. So right now, put cystic fibrosis and albinism in your recessive disorder box. Doesn't that look like a beautiful both A and B question? It does to me. Next, Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is an autosomal dominant. That means go. Um, um, oh, well, this one's messed up. Don't look at this. It's wrong. Let's look at the Punnett square for Huntington. Oh, 
Is it a better one? It's so small. Where is the Okay. So let's look at uh let's look at Huntington's. So this is autosomal recessive. Let's look at what autosomal dominant looks like. This happened. Oh, creepy ghost in the machine. All right. Okay. Okay. I'm all alone in this room. The polter goose is messing with me. All righty. So right now, um, this is uh, the symbol for Mars. So it's got a shield and an arrow. So that means what? This is daddy. And uh, um, this is like uh, uh, a circle with a little handle, and that's a mirror because women are pretty. So that's what, Venus. So this is mommy. So what could I ask you right here? And this is an example of uh, hunting this with an H, okay? So what's the first thing I could ask? What is the uh, genotype of dad? And genotype means what? The letters. So uh, dad is what? Heterozygous. What is the genotype of mom? Also heterozygous. Now, what is the phenotype of dad? So I got to look at the kids. Capital H, lowercase h. That means dad has what? Dad has hunting goods. So let me draw an arrow here. And then uh, what's the phenotype of dad? He has hunting things. Ever. Hunting. And Huntington's disease is a neurologic. So he has it. Mom has the same genotype. So what's her phenotype? She also has it. So both of them have Huntington's disease. Who knows? Maybe they met at a Huntington's party. Who knows? But now let's figure out how do I know that it's autosomal dominant? Well, I look at the kids or who are affected. Is this kid affected? Yup. This kid has Huntington's disease. Does this kid have Huntington's disease? Yup. Does this kid have Huntington's disease? Yes. So what do they all have in common? They have a dominant allele somewhere. But look at the one kid that's normal, right? Because uh, this one kid, she doesn't have anything, right? So she's normal. So the ratio now is three to one. Three will get it. One won't. So what are the odds you're going to get Huntington's disease in this um, uh, in this Punnett square? You can see it's what? 75%. And then what are what's the chance that uh, the kid will be perfectly normal? Let's draw it another color. Only what? 25%. So you can see Huntington's autosomal dominant is anything that a dominant came out. So let's review again what kind of questions I could ask. I could ask the genotype of dad, heterozygous. Genotype of mom, heterozygous. Phenotype of dad, dad has Huntington's disease. Phenotype of mom, mom has Huntington's disease. How about this kid, homozygous dominant, right? And what does he have? Huntington's. How about this kid, heterozygous? Huntington's. This kid, heterozygous, Huntington's. But this kid is homozygous, recessive. He's perfectly normal. So if I see all these dominants, right? That means this is what? An autosomal dominant disease. Auto.
So that is the mode of inheritance. So now we know two, three diseases now. Two of them were autosomal recessive, and this one now Huntington's, which is a um, neurologic disorder, right, is now an autosomal dominant disease. Look at that. I said, no. uh, well, well, this one, if you can see it, it's 50 50 because the dad here was perfectly normal. Mom had Huntington. So they had two kids here who uh, don't have the disease, two kids here that have the disease. So what are the odds? 50%. Okay. And you can see here in the um, um, uh, see, they got it backwards. Mom is well. See, this is why I don't like this slide as well. Mom is the one who got hit. If it the square is full, that means they have the disease. If the square is uh, shaded or half, that means they um, um, they are a carrier. If this if the the shape is empty. Right, that means they're perfectly normal. Square is male, circle is female. And if the lines connect, that means they're related. If the lines are, are, are away, that like, like if there's a square here or a circle here, that means they're not related to these people. If you're related by blood, there's gonna be a line. And if you see a line going right through it like this, that means the person's dead. See if this one's accurate. Yep, dad's heterozygous, and so is mom. So what did it produce? It produced uh, um, three kids, uh, or three to one. So 75% of the kids would most likely have it. Those, and um, one of them won't. And you can see here, um, this is one third didn't, and two thirds of them have the disease. So I could ask you, in a homozygous dominant for this pedigree, that's Joe, square, that's Mary, circle. This is first generation. So Joe and Mary are the parents. Does Joe have cystic fibrosis? He goes, he goes and, ooh, wait a minute, I'm looking at it as a different disease. Does Joe have uh, cystic, cystic fibrosis? Nope, he's a carrier. Does Mary have cystic fibrosis? Nope, he's a carrier. Who are their kids? Bill, Sue, and Tina. Does Bill, their son, do they have cystic fibrosis? Nope. Does Sue have it? Nope, she's a carrier. But does Tina have it? Yep, he has the full bone disease. And that's how you would um, read a pedigree. And that's the kind of questions that would come out on a pedigree question. Pedigrees are kind of easy. You just read it, what it is. It just gets tricky when, um, um, like for a future, uh, they start relating this one to this. But for my class, it's either going to be this kind of question or this kind of question. I'm not going to put them together. But eventually, you're going to need to put them together. But for now, if I ask a Punnett square question, it's going to be Punnett square question. If I ask a pedigree, it's only going to be pedigree question. I won't ask you to combine the two. All right, it's 1020. Let's take a 10 minute break and then uh, continue on uh, with this chapter. So let me put on the timer. And I'll see you guys in 10 minutes.
All right. And welcome back. This is K Billy's Super Sounds of the 80s. All right. Let us now discuss Mendelian extensions. Everything, the three, last three diseases that we were talking about is what they call complete dominance, meaning that if there's a capital uh, allele genotype, that thing is going to be expressed and it will overshadow um, the recessive gene. There are other instances where that doesn't happen, where the recessive gene also either mixes or comes out. Okay. All right. So let's talk about codominance. Codominance is when two things, two alleles, are equally dominant. And a classic example is ABO blood typing. So A and B, when they're paired, both of them get expressed. So an example of codominance, I want you to think ABO blood typing. Um, ABO blood typing is also an example of multiple alleles. That means um, it's it goes it's it's on more than um, it, it requires more than one pair to read. So you're going to have multiple alleles. It's going to take three alleles because you have A, you have B, and you have O. That's why they call it the A B O system. That means it is more than two alleles, right? So it's like a triplet. Therefore. ABL blood typing is also an example of multiple alleles. So that looks like a beautiful example. Uh, which of the following are examples of codominance and multiple alleles? It's what? ABO blood typing. Okay. Now let's get into uh, sickle cell anemia and familial hypercholesterolemia. Now, sickle cell anemia is uh, what they um, uh, what they call incomplete dominance. Just the title for that, right? That means you're going to have something called the sickle cell trait. So let's look at um, sickle cell dominance. Do they have it here? No. So let's look at. Uh, What was I talking about? Sickle cell Punnett spots. Okay, so let's look at this. Remember everything on this I, on this um, Microsoft Word document that I'm writing on. I will share as notes. So you can, um, and also I'll be sharing some practice questions uh, as well because some of these, some of these Punnett square questions can be quite tricky. Oh, this is annoying. Oh, this. Let's try this. Copy image. So of course, it's Huntington's autosomal do dominant. If it will work. Good. Okay. So this is an example. Let me get my picture format. You know what? I'll put a I'm going to put this thing in there. Okay. So this is uh, sickle cell. And sickle cell is, uh, well, let's figure it out. So the first thing I have to ask myself, what is 
the um, uh, what is the genotype of dad? So that's uh, capital S, lowercase s. So dad is what? Heterozygous. What's the genotype of mom? Mom has a capital S and a lowercase s. So mom is what? Heterozygous. Okay. Now, let let me now um, insert. Can I insert a text file? Nope, I can't. I'll just draw on it. So, what if I told you that this kid right here, which is autosomal dominant, so this kid right here will uh, be totally normal. He's not going to have sickle cell trait, nor will he or she have sickle cell disease. Who's going to get hit? This kid right here, the autosomal recessive, lowercase s, lowercase s. This kid has sickle cell disease. This one can potentially be in and out of the hospital. And it's going to have full blown uh, symptom. But these two kids, they have sickle cell trait. They're going to have a very mild version of the disease. So when you see something like this, when you see different levels of symptomology, you know, like mild versus severe. Trait is mild, a sickle cell disease is severe, then you know we're dealing with what? Incomplete dominance. And who's the kid who, who are the kids who got hit? What do they all have in common? They have a lowercase s, and lowercase s is recessive. So this is incomplete dominance, autosomal recessive. And this is called sickle cell disease versus sickle cell trait. Wow. I'm ready to get mighty off. So how did I know it was autosomal recessive? Because who got hit with the disease? Lowercase s, lowercase s. So that's what? Recessive, right? And um, um, sickle cell anemia is not... Uh, Excellent. So it's part of from any chromosome one to twenty two. So this is autosomal. And what is the uh, phenotype of dad? Capital S, lowercase s. The phenotype. He will have sickle cell trait. Let me draw a circle, a little arrow. That's dad. Dad has sickle cell trait. How about mom? Mom. Is that by your side? So mom's over here. Got the circle with a little plus. Okay. And that's female, that's mom, capital S, lowercase s. So mom too has sickle cell what? Trait. So those are the kind of questions uh, I could ask for an incomplete dominance. And how do you know it's incomplete dominance? You have different levels of the disease, all are all in the same family. Trait, mild, very, very mild. My last uh, patient, his sister had little to no symptoms, but the 17-year-old male had severe, severe symptoms and had, had sickle cell crisis on a regular basis. It was hard to watch. So this is 
So this is an example of incomplete the uh, incomplete dominance. You can see now how uh, the sickle cell, even though it's a lowercase s, is going to shine a little bit, even in the presence of a capital S. So that's called incomplete dominance. Another example of this is um, type 1, 2, 3, and 4, familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, these patients have very different um, within the same family, right? Um, of course, if you have hypercholesterolemia, you're going to have increase of heart problems. And uh, homozygous dominant, right? So let's call them capital F, uh, capital F. They have perfectly normal cholesterol. So they're unaffected. But the homozygous uh, recessive person is going to have uh, have what? Severe problem. So that's the person with like a lowercase, lowercase. They have fat coming out of their eyes, out of their joints. Yes, fat coming out of your eyes, right? And they get they get the disease early. But a heterozygous, the the supposed carrier, you know, they have some, right? They have some uh, LDL problems, but not to the level of their brother or sister that is lowercase f, lowercase f. Okay. So familial hypercholesterolemia and sickle cell, incomplete dominance. How do I know? There are multiple levels of disease. Okay. And you can see here, right? General population of, uh, have... Um, uh, cholesterol around here. If you're uh, if you're a homo homozygous, right? Look at that. Look how high it is. Ridiculous. Heterozygous, eh? Not so bad. Polygenic traits. The next thing. Poly means many. That means it takes many genes, and height, skin color, eye color, and there's a there's a picture here, like especially skin, skin color. It's polygenic. You can see there's three sets of uh, pairs. So it's on three different loci. It's on three different um, uh, sets of alleles, right? So when something's polygenic, that means it requires multiple genes to determine whether you're going to be tall, short, or in between, right? And then um uh, skin color the same you know within the a family you got what someone who's really has a lot of melanin and there's others questioning um that they even belong to the same family but again different same thing with eye color you ever meet somebody with uh uh one eye different color than the other because it's polygenic okay so height skin color eye color looks like a beautiful all of the above question now, pleiotropy, right? Um, pleiotropy, the best way to put it is you have one gene that's going to give you lots of problems or lots of uh, physical effects. So one gene, multiple effects. And the example of it is this uh, disease, autosomal dominant. Put that with uh, your Huntington's, right? If we're asking about which one's autosomal dominant, which one's autosomal recessive, and that's what, Marfan's. Marfan syndrome, the problem is, is that these patients don't have the protein fibrillin. If they don't have the protein fibrillin, um, uh, they are very flexible. OK. And um, the one person that I keep on thinking of is Jim Carrey. Because he's very flexible and you can see his eyes and his limbs, he's they're tall and um, usually people with Marfan syndrome, they're tall and lanky. Right, maybe even look a little bit on the anemic side, which is definitely Jim Carrey. Right. So let me even ask. Let's ask the almighty Google. Yeah, he has more fans. Knew it. 
because when you when you look at someone uh, um, who has Marfans, they're tall, they're skinny, and it's it's usually the kid in class who who's like double and triple jointed. You know, they bend their wrist back to touch their elbow. You know, weird stuff like that because they don't have a lot of fibrillin. Their connective tissue is kind of loose. And that is an example of pleiotrophy. You have a single defect that now is found in a whole bunch of multiple places. So you got joints all over yourself. And of course, Marfan's is an autosomal dominant. Um, so that means uh, whoever has a capital M in their uh, genotype, then they're definitely going to uh, have uh, this disease. Now, all these other things are really cool, except for dislocation of the eye, weakness of your aortic wall, all the effects, you know, because your aorta is made out of a uh, connective tissue that has a lot of fibrillin in it. And uh, also your, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, uh, your your thoracic cage as well. Polygenic, eye color polygenic. Now let's look at the sex-linked or X-linked traits. So sex-linked, that means uh, it's typically located on the X chromosome because everyone has at least one X, right? Um, so um, um, like if uh, like if it's attached to an X chromosome, that means a female patient will see that trait more than the male patient. There are three examples of uh, sex-linked um, sex linked or X-linked diseases. Red-green color blindness, hemophilia, which is a uh, problem of your uh, hemoglobin chain, and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is a congenital disorder, you're born with it, where your muscles uh, don't grow properly and it has significant uh, muscle weakness and muscle coordination problems. So those are three examples of X-linked traits. That means these three things can be found on the 23rd chromosome, also known as your bar body. Now this one, which I skipped, this shows you that what are the odds, um, when I was in obstetrics and outpatient, how many times did the couple always ask me, hey, doc, do you think it's going to be a girl or it's a boy? Or um, we're, we're, we're looking to have a girl or have a boy. You can't predict it. And why? Because dad has XY. Mom has XX. So what are the odds the kid's going to be female? 50%. What are the odds the kid's going to be male? 50%. And those are all the possible combinations. There is no other combination. Right, so X, Y, and you match it to X, X on a Punnett square, so it's 50, 50. Okay. So I had a patient who goes, no, you got to do it standing up. And the other one said, you got to do it upside down. No, doesn't matter. Genetics, it's 50, 50. But again, you, you, I've had families, I have family members. I have one family member, it's like a second cousin. Uh, she had five boys. Uh, and my other cousin, four boys, one girl. The very last one was uh, was a girl. Okay. Uh, sex determination, of course, it's what X Y male X X female. Let's look at these other terms. We already went to uh, dominance, but penetrance, right? is how much, if something penetrates, right? It's, it's, it's either all or none of a genotype. It's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like a, a, a form of dominance. And expressivity is how much of the phenotype or what, what's gonna come out in the real world will actually come out. And that's expressivity, right? And um, uh, behavior is not, doesn't have 100% penetrance. It's not all or none. So if your dad's an alcoholic, uh, the, the expressivity, according to the American Psychiatric Association, is what, 
means what? That if you hang out in bars, if you do these other things, the odds of you being uh, having similar behaviors, the expressivity will increase. Okay. Same thing with criminality. They they tried to uh, there there's a part of it that is genetic, especially with. Um, but it's funny, not the violent crime, like petty crime. Uh, has better expressivity, but violent crime, especially serial killers, serial killers, it's more of an actual penetrant. It's either all or none. Um, if you watch that, um, uh, I forgot it was Netflix that uh, had the story about uh, who's that dude who were like eight people, uh, and he used to uh, uh, he used to like hang out in gay bars in San Francisco and San Diego and and like eat people. Um, well, I forgot his name, but um, my mother and I went to a conference because we wanted to see what a PET scan of, of a psychopaths and sociopaths look like. By the way, it looks exactly like me and you. So we don't know why people become serial killers. It is 100% penetrance, pen, uh, penetrance. It's either all or none. You're either, you're either going to do horrible things or you won't, and there's no predictor of it. And that's the scary part. But for other things that are less dramatic, expressivity is uh, for behaviors is around 40%. So complete, of course, 100%, right? The alleles will express the phenotype. Incomplete penetrance, eh, it'll kind of. Okay. Example is an autosomal dominant trait where you have uh, more, than, uh, uh, more than 10 fingers or toes, and that's called polydactyly. And then you have variable expression. Again, different phenotypes, different intensities with different people. You also have variable expressivity in polydactyly. Uh, heterogeneity. Um, yeah. uh, again, phenotype, eh, nice to know. The other stuff is better. Sex linked versus sex influence. If it's um, um, if it's sex limited, that means it's specific for either male or female. But if it's sex influenced, that means it is um, uh, due to some hormonal cause. And uh, the classic uh, um, example for sex influence is baldness, because um, baldness is directly related to um, testosterone levels. The more testosterone you have, uh, the more likely you'll have baldness or alopecia. Multifactorial, we already talked about, right? Eye color, right? Now. Common diseases that are multifactorial are, of course, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, especially a lot of the diseases that have external influences. Like heart disease is also based on your diet and your activity level. Same thing with diabetes, same thing with hypertension, even cancers, right? If you're exposed to uh, carcinogens, right? Like let's say, for example, you're exposed more to the sun Right? You have a job that makes you go outside in the sun all day. The odds of you getting basal cell carcinoma of your skin are pretty darn good. So uh, multifactorial just means that there are uh, there are environmental factors that are uh, that are in play. Okay. Chromosomes, of course, the chromosomes they they are in the specific code, specific order. So anytime you rearrange the code, you're going to have problems, right? So inversion, uh, deletions, or, um, uh, and uh, other rearrangements, of course, is going to make the code wrong. And if the code goes wrong, then what's the, uh, the phenotype going to eventually be? It's eventually going to be abnormal. Uh, polyploidy. Remember. In order to be a human being, you need 23 pairs or 46 chromosomes. But if you have an extra set, it's called polyploidy, and it's going to cause 
some rather uh, really bad things, right? So, um, but typically, the fetus in polyploidy will uh, uh, will will not make term. Um, there'll be a stop codon during to er due to errors, and the code will say what stop. Now, aneuploidy is the exact opposite. You're missing a set. So euploid, that's you. You should have a normal amount. But aneuploid, and means no or not. That means you have something missing. And odds are aneuploidy is caused by non-disjunction. Remember we looked at meiosis, right? There's two times where the genes split. Well, on meiosis one or meiosis two, there's going to be a pair that fails to separate. And that's called non-disjunction. And when you have non-disjunction, you're going to have the trisomies. Downs, Patau, and Edwards. Down syndrome is the most common. Patau and Edwards are, are relatively rare, but their Patau and Edwards occur at chromosome number 13 and chromosome number 18, respectively, where there was an aneuploidy situation where there was a non-disjunction. But Downs is the most common. And um, these are all, and Down syndrome occurs on chromosome 21, hence the term trisomy 21. Patau's 13, Edwards 18. And Patau and Edwards, um, uh, they will not go to term. It's very rare that the, um, um, the child would be born. Um, but Down's, uh, uh, it comes along with it not only uh, some level of uh, uh, IQ uh, drop, also along with the syndrome, unfortunately, they have higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. They have higher risk for um, uh, um, cardiovascular and um, uh, LDL problems, right? And of course, um, the classic um, down syndrome faces, low set ears, sin increase. The word syndrome means sin means the same. Drome means to run along. So they run all together. And um, Down syndrome patient Down syndrome patient will have uh, far more difficulties uh, rather than uh, quote unquote IQ problems. Um, um, and I've told this story before. I've graduated. Uh, several Down syndrome uh, students, um, and it goes to show you your IQ is a little low. It feels it can easily be compensated with hard work. And um, I'm one of the few doctors that you know that who actually knows his IQ. Mine is straight up 95, 100 in that area. That is perfectly normal. Right? But how do I have advanced degrees? Because I work harder than my neighbor. And I could tell you the three or four students who are my students have downs, they work harder than everybody else. Did they get A's? No. But they passed. They did they did well and they got jobs. Right. But um all four of them I recall all had other um associated health issues. Um uh, prenatal tests, you don't need to know. This is not and yeah, all these other things you don't need to know. Oh, here's one thing you should know, just on a personal note. Don't get a 3D ultrasound. They're useless. They don't tell you anything. And of course your kid's going to look like you. If it doesn't, there's a problem. Okay. Genomics, healthcare. Uh, so let's see what else. So nope, that's it. That's everything we have. Now, another thing I'm going to publish. Let me get the, this out is this uh, because it's not the the first 34 questions they're pretty straightforward very easy you you probably could have made them but it's these questions the ones on the end they're the ones that uh will kind of help you um and i got the answers on it and i have a nice um um what do you call that here uh pedigree question as well all right, so both of these things I'm going to publish. Does anyone have uh, any questions before we sign off? 
and I saw some emails pop up. I'll answer them shortly. All right. Uh, anyone? Let me look at the. Um, let me look at the chat. Yeah, Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh, that was bothering me. All right. And uh, a couple of you uh, got kicked out. Uh, your computer died. I can't help you there. But remember, it's recorded, so um, 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 we can uh, you, you can play it back to to the end parts. And of course, I'm gonna uh, publish my uh, the questions. So you guys now have my questions for the last two. So you should ace this thing. You should ace Thursday as well because you had two extra days. So if no one has any uh, questions comments or recipes. If not, uh, uh, let's call it a day and I'll sign off. I'll give it a couple more minutes for any uh, uh, questions on the chat. But other than that, have a good one. I'll see you Thursday, 8 a.m. promptly. Professor, are we going to talk about the project or are we going there to talk did. about that on? Oh, sorry. <laughs> and then I had a video on it. And there's instructions, so go hit those up today. And then uh, the assignments are also posted. And then shoot me if you got any questions, especially if you didn't do it last term. But if you did it last term, it's the same exact thing. All right. Is it safe to assume everybody who's on this right now? uh is that work and let their stuff run or uh, well how can you be at work it's supposed to be in a scheduled time yeah recipes it's just a habit that i used to say because i was in a culinary school So kindly log off so uh, um, uh, I can close out and get this um, get this video into YouTube and uh, into uh, into your announcement so you guys can. But remember, focus on the thing on Thursday first, okay? And then probably Thursday, since we went through all of this, we'll go through all the questions and. Uh, and um, uh, have a, another um, like open session, uh, uh, question practice session on, on Thursday. So if you're still on, kindly log off so I can, or if you have any questions, uh, put it in the chat so I can address it. And you, Jim Carrey had more fans. Yep, I got everybody. And everybody's on time. Everyone's good. So attendance has already been posted. All right. And it goes, well, there's only like four people, well, three people left. I'm going to. Call it a day. You guys probably uh, just uh, left your uh, um, thing on. All righty. Have a good one, everybody.